All right, folks. So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about directional antennas. And I have some, some words, some sentences here that we're going to go through. Directional antennas can be fantastic for amateur radio operators. They offer increased performance over omnidirectional antennas. And it's not just omnidirectional antennas, it's also antennas like dipoles. When we talk about omnidirectional antennas, we're talking about vertical antennas that radiate equally in all directions. With a directional antenna, we talk about antennas that we control the radiation pattern into a specific area of focus. And that particular area of focus is going to be beneficial for receiving as well as transmitting signals. However, with any technology, there are some drawbacks to take into consideration. In this video, what we're going to do is cover the basics of directional antennas. We're going to talk about their benefits, some of the drawbacks, and then we're going to talk about what you need to know to get started. So let's start off by basically asking, what is a directional antenna or what are directional antennas? A directional antenna is a type of antenna that focuses radio wave or signal energy in a specific direction. We kind of talked about that a little bit. This allows you to send or receive signals over a greater distance compared to omnidirectional antennas, which radiate uh, their energy in all directions. Some of the popular types of directional antennas that you'll hear about are called Yagi's or Yagi Uda's, uh, log periodics, and quad antennas, although there's many more on the market. And you can get directional antennas or build directional antennas for a variety of frequencies. You'll hear people talk about a 40 meter directional antenna, like a beam, where you hear people say, oh, I built a two meter Yagi so I can work satellites or get into a repeater that's a little bit further away. So in this particular chart, what we have is a 3D plot of a Yagi antenna. And we're looking at this antenna from the side, slightly looking down. And then you can see a model of the radiation pattern or the directionality of where this antenna focuses most of its energy. And you can see that in the larger lower uh, lobe that points off to the right. And you can see how that radiation grows as it continues to propagate further and further away from the antenna. You can also see that some of our energy is focused upward, and that's not going to be of much use for us. Some folks may argue that that's good for NVIS, but I don't think you would use a Yagi, for example, for a near vertical incident sky wave antenna. Now, what you want to look at here is, is that that main lobe, the biggest lobe, has a relatively low takeoff angle. The takeoff angle is where most of your energy is focused at a particular um, angle from the ground and then will go up and then it will refract off of the ionosphere for sky wave propagation. I'm throwing out a lot of antenna terms here and I'll link my antenna playlist where I explain all of these things and you can check that out. But with a little bit of a lower takeoff angle, the angle for which our signal hits the ionosphere is going to be more obtuse than acute. So think back to middle school geometry class. An obtuse angle is wider than an acute angle, and that means that we'll go further with our signal and have better DX capabilities, because when our signal refracts off of the ionosphere, it will go further than a steeper angle or an acute angle. Hopefully that makes sense for everybody. In this particular chart, what we're looking at is a 3D plot of a vertical antenna. And then here you can see how the energy radiates in all directions equally. So you'll be able to send and receive equally as well, depending upon the station that you're making contact with. With the directional antenna that we saw before, we're going to concentrate our energy getting out to that station. And then also we're going to be able to concentrate the energy coming back and have a cleaner, stronger signal. So at this point in the video, you're probably asking, what are the benefits of directional antennas? So here are some of the main benefits. Increased signal strength in the desired direction. We kind of talked about that as we went through the models. And that's for receiving and transmitting our signals. It's reduced interference from unwanted signals. But because we're focusing our energy in a particular direction, there may be stations or there may be something uh, generating sound or a signal that we don't want to hear. Because our antenna performs at a lower level in the directions other than our desired direction, we're going to pick up those stations a little bit lower than what we would if we had an omni omnidirectional antenna. And this is going to help us out in a variety of ways. It's going to reduce interference from those un unwanted signals, and it's going to improve our signal-to-noise ratio. So if you operate HF, one of the things that you'll notice on some days it's worse, but you have something called a noise floor. And that is just general atmospheric noise. It's, it's interference noise. It's noise that your radio is picking up. If you're able to eliminate this on the back side of your antenna and maybe on the sides of your antenna and only focus on things that are in front of you, 
you're going to be picking up less of this noise. And that's going to mean any signal coming in is going to be stronger relative to your noise floor, thus improving your signal to noise ratio. It's also going to allow you to get greater reach for long distance communication. And that's what a lot of hams are after. And it is also more efficient use of transmitted power. So let's just take a little bit to talk a little bit of time to talk about the uh, more efficient use of, of the power. If I have, uh, let's just say 50 watts of power going out of my antenna and I focus that on a certain direction that improves the gain or the performance of my antenna by say three or six dB decibels, 3 dB would make my 50 watts seem like it's a 100 watt station and 6 dB would make my 50 watt station, we would double it for the three, would be 100 and we double again, would now be performing as if I was transmitting with 200 watts. And that's pretty handy. So I put this chart in here and what it is is a 2D polar plot or far field plot, I should say of a Yagi antenna, the one that we were looking at the 3D plot of earlier. And when you're looking down at this, that is the diagram on the left hand side, you can really get an appreciation for how this radiation pattern emanates from the center of that circle. And you can see how the directionality works. Also, the, the diagram on the right hand side is a 2D plot if you were looking at the side of your antenna from the direction of, of lower radiation and you can see how the energy propagates out. Now what I did is I put a seven degree angle on there and you might be able to see that with that red dot. And seven degrees, five degrees, eight degrees, there's a lot of debate, but those are the takeoff angles that you want for the best DX or long distance communication. You're gonna get a ton of long distance communication out of an antenna like this. So we're talking about all these positive things. Let's talk a little bit about some of the drawbacks. Now, typically for a directional antenna, you need a rotor to physically orient the antenna in the desired direction. This requires additional equipment. It's a more complex installation. It can be time consuming and expensive. Now, I know some folks are gonna say, well, I use a two meter Yagi antenna and I hold it in my hand and I rotate it and point it. Yep, so you don't need a rotor for something like that. Typically, you would use a rotor for some of the larger HF antennas that are difficult to move around. And you would use those in your permanent home QTH or club locations. Directional antennas are typically larger and more complex than omnidirectional antennas. So if you think about a Yagi, and we have a picture of one coming up, it has multiple uh, elements that radiate and concentrate and direct your energy. Your dipole is a single wire that runs through the air. So you can see how they're a little bit more complex. There's more parts, and these parts move when you're using a rotor. Um, these parts make it a little bit more difficult to install and maintain. Now, your energy is focused in a specific direction. Directional antennas can't receive signals from all directions. This means that it's possible for you to miss an important signal, or there could be some kind of signal or some kind of transmission that you want to hear, and you'll never even know it because your antenna is pointing into another direction. So you need to be a little bit more aware. A lot of folks will partner a different type of antenna with their directional antenna, so they don't miss out on those signals and know where to point their directional antenna. One of the things that uh, make hams nervous or they'll ask questions about are directional antennas expensive? And the answer is it depends. But in reality, they're more expensive. The cost of a directional antenna can vary widely based on factors such as the frequency range, the size, and the design. So for example, if you're building a directional antenna for 10 meters, it's going to be smaller, lighter, and more compact than if you're building one for, say, 40 meters. Yagi or loop antennas can be built, built relatively inexpensively. While others like commercial grade beam antennas can cost several hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars. And typically you wanna have a strong, reliable way to mount these antennas. And that's where folks look at using a mast. Now, if you use a mast, you might be looking at a professional installation that's gonna require a concrete base. Your antenna has to have a mechanism for raising and lowering the, um, the mast if you have to do any kind of maintenance or work. You typically have to run cabling up there and that could include power. So now you may be asking, what's involved in setting up a directional antenna? The first thing you need to do is determine the frequency range you want to operate on, the direction you want to focus your signal on, and you're also going to have to talk about budgeting. So you want to choose the appropriate type of directional antenna based on the frequency range and the direction requirements. You may want to use a quad antenna, a beam antenna, a Yagi antenna. There's a bunch of different kinds on the, on the market, and the different types and the benefits of each type of directional antenna is a little bit beyond the scope of this video. 
So you want to make sure that you get the necessary materials that you're going to need, including the antenna. We talked a little bit about coaxial cable, mounting hardware, and components like a rotor and a way to rise and lower your mast. Maybe you're going to use a ground-mounted mast. Maybe you're going to use a structure mounted to the roof of your home. All these things are things you want to be taking into consideration. Another thing is, is that you want to make sure that you're mounting your antenna in a way that is safe and secure. We talked a little bit about a mast or a tower, but you want to make sure that everything is connected in a way that is safe and is not going to cause any risks or hazards. You also want to make sure that you can adjust your antenna for optimal performance by tuning the elements and making sure that the desired frequency is uh, resonant on that antenna and you want to verify your different directions for maximum gain. And the next thing is, is you want to test your setup and make any necessary adjustments for improved performance. Initially, when folks put up antennas, especially directional antennas, they may have one expectation in reality is something different. And this is going to require a tuning process and a system of continual improvement until you get your antenna working in an optimal way. So here's an example of a directional antenna and what you can see are there are three different elements there. And when you take a look at that, the one that is the center closest to the mast, that's your radiating element. And then the one that is over to the right-hand side is your director. That means it's helping direct your signal. The one on the left is your reflector. That means that the signal is reflecting off of that and then being directed by the one on the right. You can see that these elements have loading coils on each one of those. That makes this antenna seem electrically longer than it really is and will allow you to operate at different frequencies. And that is a complexity that you see in some of these types of antennas that we talked about earlier. You can see the cabling running up and down the mast. This cabling needs to be maintained, and that's why you talk about the ability to raise and lower your antenna. And in some cases, hams even climb up these antennas to do maintenance or work. If you climb up an antenna, you have to make sure that you're being safe. It's a dangerous thing to do. Folks slip and fall all the time, and you can also get injured while you're working on antennas like this. Down the center of the mast, you see a, well, down the center of the, the um, tower, I should say, you see a pole or a mast, and that terminates at the lower part of the picture into a rotor. You can see the power cable coming off of that if you look carefully. That rotor is what steers or directs your antenna from one, one, one point to another. So we talked a little bit about signal to noise ratio, but I wanted to be a little bit more specific. And it's a metric used to quantify the quality of a communication signal to the amount of background noise. The higher your signal to noise ratio, the better quality of the signal, and it's easier to extract information that's being transmitted. Whether it's a digital signal or maybe somebody's talking on an AM modulated or a single sideband modulated signal, it'll be easier to hear with a higher signal to noise ratio. And that should be making sense. Improving the signal to noise ratio, often referred to as SNR, can help ensure clear and reliable communication, especially in weak signal or long distance situations. Another thing I wanted to cover in a little more depth is antenna gain. And it's the measure of the increase in power provided by an antenna compared to the reference antenna, typically an isotropic radiator or a dipole. So when you see an antenna and the manufacturer says, oh, this gives you an extra 2.5 dB or an extra 2.5 dBi, 2 dBi, what they're talking about is, is how that antenna compares against a reference antenna. So when I look at antennas to buy something and I want to talk about the gain, I typically compare it to a dB. That would be dB compared to a dipole. dBi is compared to an isotropic radiator. Here we have it's expressed in dB or decibels and is calculated as the ratio of the power density in a given direction to the power density radiated by an isotropic radiator. The higher the gain, the more the antenna concentrates the energy in a given direction, resulting in a stronger signal. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up. Hopefully that clears up any questions that you may have. If you have further questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching, everybody.